right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, for our first EI Live K-12 session of uh, 2021. So today we're going to hear from Dale Willman of the Earth Institute, and he's going to uh, talk to us about how, as a journalist, uh, he's been communicating climate change. And um, as we noted in the EI Live K-12 uh, session description, this is um, this is targeted towards uh, high school students, but if you're not a high school student and you're joining us, welcome. We are open to having everyone join us for these sessions. Um, and we're going to be using the Q&A box um, in, the, in the Zoom webinar today. If you have a question during the session, feel free to type it in there. We'll monitor that throughout the session. And when Dale is uh, finished with his presentation, we'll get back to, we'll definitely get to the Q&A. Um, I just want to take a quick moment and let you know um, for those uh, students, teachers, or parents watching this, um, Dale is actually going to be doing an Earth Institute pre-college workshop on this very specific topic. Um, and it's going to take place starting in April. Um, if you have any questions about that workshop, uh, so it's part of the Earth Institute pre-college effort. Um, these are non-degree uh, workshops that our experts and faculty members are doing and they are taking place um, throughout this semester and Dale is going to be covering one about climate change, communication specifically, uh, strategies um, and best practices in communications. How do you uh, figure out who your audience members are? How do you figure out how to target uh, your audience members? How you craft your message? So all the great fun things um, about how we bring this message out to a broader audience. Uh, so if you'd like to learn more about that pre-college program, uh, I'll put the um, link uh, in the chat box in a little bit. And or if you have any questions about that, feel free to contact me directly. Uh, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dale. Thanks. Uh, this this kind of uh, program is always a little unsettling because you don't know where to look because I can't see you. But hopefully you can all see me. I'm excited to be doing this with you today. Very quickly, a little bit about me. Um, just so you know some of my background. As Cassie said, I worked for the Earth Institute at Columbia. Before that, I worked uh, a lot in the media. I worked in Washington, D.C. for 15 years for CNN, CBS, and NPR. Uh, I still work at NPR periodically. I've also been a trainer working on five continents, and I've trained journalists in all aspects of their work. So let's get right to it. What is communication? The simple answer is what you see on your screen, the transfer of information to produce greater understanding. But what does that actually mean? I wish we had more time because I'd love to get your feedback and your thoughts on about communication. But basically, this means trying to increase someone's understanding of an issue or of a cause. There are a lot of ways to do this. Perhaps the simplest is talking to people. We do it every day, and we'll discuss that more in a minute. You can also write. You can produce videos or take photos. You can create charts or maps. These things are uh, visuals are often very important ways to connect, especially very dense information. All of these forms are communication. And so is nonverbal things like body language and the way you use your hands. My, my wife is Italian, so she talks with her hands a lot. And it's very, very strong way of communication. So are you a communicator? That's a big question for you. Are you a communicator? Can you, you can't raise your hand on this format, so I really can't see, but you are, and you do in many different ways. So your mom may say to you, how is your day? You have to communicate. As a parent of two children, I know that many kids don't do that very well, <laughs> but nonetheless, you have to communicate something about your day to your mom. How about your teacher? Did you finish your assignment? That's something that's very important and information that you need to convey once again. So again, that's a form of communication. When you're talking to your friends, dude, did you hear that new Prince tune on the radio? I'll talk about that statement a little bit later because uh, <laughs> it's a bit stupid and I know that. But so how about this? Here's a question for you. What did I have for lunch? What did you have for lunch? There are many ways to answer that. <clears throat> I'm gonna give you two. Today, I had a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for lunch. Is that good communication? It's communication. I conveyed information to you. 
but there's not a lot of value in that. But how about a different way? And this is more of a storytelling way of telling that. So here, my grandmother is no longer alive, but when I was younger, every summer she would make me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for lunch. We'd sit and talk and we'd laugh and everything always seemed to be a bit better no matter how my day had been. So today when I have a PBJ, I think of my grandmother. She was a pretty smart woman. While she made lunches special, she also made me healthier. Peanuts are a good source of protein and you need protein to build muscles. They also have calcium, which makes your bones stronger and magnesium. Magnesium helps to keep our nervous system working well. And you can go on with that, but you get the idea of, of storytelling as a means of communication and a way to get more information out in a very compelling way. So instead of just, I had a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for lunch, I told you more information that actually taught you about the value of that peanut butter and jelly sandwich too, but I connected it with a personal story, which makes that information seem more important. So what makes that a better form of communication? I want to look at a few types now. And as you look at them, I want you to think about what makes them effective or what reasons they don't work for you. So think about that as you see these. So this is the first one. Does this transfer information by our definition of what communication is? Sure. Does it create greater understanding? Maybe not. In order to do that, it has to engage you. Whatever form of communication you're, you're using has to engage you. But this one is really dense. Lots of big words. The graphic may work, but it's kind of hard to read and you need to understand the key to make sense of it. It can produce greater understanding, but you got to work hard at it, right? So how about this? This just came across this morning, 11 o'clock, 11.05. Does this transfer information? Is it greater understanding? Sure, that headline can really grab your attention. Then the text goes on to give additional information that makes more sense out of that headline. And that's called context. And context is an important part of communication. It gives that extra information that helps us to make sense out of what you're learning. Being the hottest is one thing, as the headline says, to understand why is even better. Knowing that fires and cyclones and hurricanes contributed is important to your understanding. And it doesn't really catch the eye, but if you're interested in the information, it's okay to have a lot of texts. Part of this is about knowing your audience, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit too. So let's try another one. How about this slide? Now it's just a photo. And remember context, we talked about context. This photo by itself is, is somewhat powerful, but the context is missing right now. So it needs more than just a photo. So how about if I give you some of the context here? This is a group of refugees in South Sudan. They had fled um, revenge killings in their community. So in their villages. So one village, someone raided and stole a cow. So the second village that had lost the cow the next week raided the, the, the village back and shot the chief's daughter. And then that village came back and shot two people. <clears throat> this sort of back and forth revenge killing was pretty common in South Sudan. And it's the way they resolved a lot of fights. I describe South Sudan as Texas with about 10 times as many guns, uh, which is hard to believe, but a lot of guns there. So a lot of these sorts of things happened. So these people fled. And they ended up in the bush. And the woman in the back in the pink is a reporter that I was with. And she's interviewing one of the people there. She had found these people. And we got there. So while she's interviewing, this woman turns around to show me what they're eating for dinner that night. And what they're eating is a grass called cheer. And this, this grass has no nutritional value whatsoever. So now this is starting to make more sense to you. So if I explain that there's no nutritional value and this is all they had to eat, <clears throat> excuse me, what that means is they would feel full while they were actually starving to death. That offers you a lot more context to make sense out of it. But this photo needs a lot of context in order to get that value out of it. So how about this one? This might look a little more familiar. This was from a Black Lives Matters protests uh, this fall in Buffalo. It's clearly from a protest. You can tell that people are angry. You know exactly why. 
It can use more context, but this pretty much stands on its own as well. This is, I think, a pretty clear example of, of strong communication. So now I wanna play you a little bit of this and tell me how this works for you as a kind of, uh, kind of communication. Fun fact, planet Earth is 4.5 billion years old. Mankind, about 140,000 years old. Let me put that in perspective. If you condense the Earth's lifespan into 24 hours, that's one full day, then we have been here on this planet for, drum roll please, three seconds. Three seconds. And look what we've done. We have modestly named ourselves Homo sapiens, meaning wise man. But is man really so wise? Smart, yes, and it's good to be smart, but not too smart for your own good. Yes, we have split the atom. Yes, we build clever machines that navigate the universe in search of new homes. But at the same time, those atoms we split created nuclear warfare. In our quest to explore the galaxy, rejects and neglects the home that we have here now. So no, that cannot be wisdom. Wisdom is different. While intelligence speaks, wisdom listens, and we willingly covered our ears to Mother Nature's screams and closed our eyes to all of her help-wanted signs. Wisdom knows that every action has an equal and opposite reaction, so if we were wise, we would not be shocked when we see storms that are stronger than ever before, or more drought, hurricanes, and wildfire than ever before, because there's more pollution than ever before, more carbon, more trees cut down than ever before. At a record pace, we have increased the extinction of animals by 1,000 times the normal rate. What a feat. In the next 10 to 100 years, every beloved animal character in every children's book is predicted to go extinct. Lions gone, rhinos gone, tiger, gorilla, elephant, polar bear gone in three seconds. Species that have been here longer than us will be gone because of us in this three seconds. In an existence shorter than a Vine video, we turn the circle of life into our own personal conveyor belt. Somebody, anybody help. We were given so much. The only planet in this solar system with life. I mean, we are one in a million. No, actually, scientifically, we are one in a billion, trillion, trillion. That's a one followed by 33 zeros. And I don't want to get too spiritual, but how are we not a miracle? We are perfectly positioned to the sun so we don't burn, but not too distant so we don't turn to ice. Goldilocks said it best, we are just right. This paradise where we are given medicine from trees, not coincidentally, but because like the song says, we are family. So sorry to, uh, sorry to stop that in the midst of it because it's a very powerful video. <clears throat> and at least that's what I think. I wish I could see you and, uh, and see your response to this because I found it to be very powerful and very engaging. And the question is why? What are the qualities of good communication beyond transferring information to produce greater understanding? So we started with a very simple definition of communication, transferring information to produce greater understanding. But as you can see, there are many ways of looking at that, many ways of interpreting it, and many ways of communication from a broad range of really, really bad communication to really, really strong and powerful communication. And there are, there are elements of communication that can make your message much more powerful, much more likely to be heard, more, much, much more likely to be actionable. And these are some of the things. So we're gonna talk about this one we just saw, then we're gonna see a full video next. But I want you to think about these elements. Was it clear? I think it was very, very clear. It was a simple message. It was, it was, it was, they hit you very quickly with it. The, the size, the, the amount of time, remember the, the in 24 hour period, we've been here for three seconds. And I'm sure you've seen that before, but to have it graphically portrayed with the images that they had, I think really brought that home and made much more sense. It was an active voice, very active voice. He's, he's a, a, a very powerful speaker. Um, his rhythm, his, his rhyming at times, it was a very, very powerful message. It was respectful. This is an important thing. You don't want to dismiss your audience. You want to be respectful of them. It was factual. 
They had a lot of facts, but the thing is they grabbed you emotionally. He grabbed you with, with the story that he was telling. And there's a belief that I have that when you grab someone emotionally, it then opens up their head so they're more able to take in important information. So that was a very important part of it. It was persuasive. What you didn't see was the ending of it when he, it became more hopeful. This is something that people talk about a lot in communication is, is the lack of hope. And, and in, in many stories that you read, many news stories that you read, it, it, it misses hope. And, and that's something that's so critical to include. You don't want people to leave with a feeling of doom and gloom and there's nothing I can do, so what does it matter? You leave them with some element of hope so they can also see that there's a future there. So now let's bring it all together. All those things that we just talked about. And I want you to watch this and see if this brings those elements together as well. So let me know what you think. Say hi, Jason. Jason, say hi. Hi. When I was six, I had a horrible asthma attack to the point where I actually had to exert myself breathing because I had so much trouble pulling air into my lungs. My sister-in-law was a nurse and she got her stethoscope and checked Jasa, threw her in my arms and told me to rush her to the emergency room right now. A lot of kids in my school have trouble breathing and have to be hospitalized. I know it was really hard for some kids in gym. There was like an entire cabinet filled with asthma medicine. This is the coal fire power plant. The coal plant spews a lot of toxins. So I knew that that had something to do with why my daughter had an asthma attack. My neighborhood isn't very rich. I don't know why there are so many plants in Bridgeport. There's the garbage plant, the sewage plant, the landfill, and the coal-fired power plant. I started searching up power plants, and when I saw how it actually affected people, I thought, that's horrible. I actually have to do something about this. PSEG is the company that runs the power plant in my neighborhood. PSEG knew what was in their smokestacks. I really wish I could get into other people's head, like people in the PSEG, what are they thinking putting polluting power plants in our backyard? I think it may be a case of environmental racism. Up in Westport, they have like mowed lawns, like picture perfect. And this is the most important thing, no power plants. No rich white neighborhood would ever allow some power plant to just be built in their backyard. So what companies do is pick a neighborhood that's poor and usually these neighborhoods are colored neighborhoods. Some people have had a really big impact on my life. Harriet Tubman proved that if you put your mind to it, you will be able to free yourself from oppression. Martin Luther King proved that not every conflict has to be solved with violence. My mom is my hero because she helps make the world a better place. She's the first sergeant in the Army Reserves. My dad, he's a musician, so he's able to inspire people and make them happy. He plays reggae music because he was born in Jamaica. What's our goal? No more coal! What's our goal? No more coal! This group called Healthy Connecticut Alliance asked me if I wanted to do this event speaking to the city hall because I had asthma and I've been affected by it. And I said, yeah, okay. She's come on stage with me a few times. 
she came on stage and she took the microphone from me and walked away with it. <laughs> She's there performing a dance. I'm like, this girl, she has no fear. I was so proud of her. I was surprised when I heard that she was writing her own speeches. Hello, everyone. My name is Jason Mullers. I am 10 years old and I attend Bryant School. I didn't know if anybody would listen to me. I am here today to talk about retiring the coal plant and restricting other bad polluters from polluting Bridgeport. Because when you're a kid, it's hard to get anybody to listen to you. I know that Fairfield County has the worst air pollution in the state. I know that because I'm smart and I looked it up on the internet. <laughs> that led to a long road of fighting and testifying. I just say what I'm feeling and it sounds a lot more powerful when you talk from the heart. It came out that they were going to close the power plant and I had to hear it a couple of times. Are you sure? Is that what they said? Where is it in writing? When I found out, I was just ecstatic because we worked so hard to get this place shut down. And it was just really satisfying to know that all of our hard work paid off and that it wouldn't be hurting anybody anymore. Hi. Even though I didn't have money, I had words and words have power. So what'd you think? I hope that if I could see you that I'd see some waving hands. Um, emotional appeal, very emotional appeal. You got to know Jason. you got to know this character. Uh, more than just the story they were telling, it was the story of her life too, and her asthma, and the role is played and her becoming active. It was a believable character. She was quite believable. Um, she had a powerful story to tell, people against big business. You know, uh, uh, going up against Goliath, great imagery, the asthma meds when they showed those, the smoke out of the pipe, the power plant, a recognizable bad guy, PSEG, the, the, the company, the, the utility company. It had a call for action. What's our goal? No coal. What's our goal? No coal. Simple, uh, easy, to, easy to grasp, call for action. And the end, it had hope. They won. So very powerful message, very powerful communication here, more than just conveying information. They did it in a way that I think grabbed people and helped them to understand the issue better and get them to feel strongly about the issue. So we're running out of time, but a few quick tips on how you can help your communication. You wanna have a story to tell. You don't wanna just spout stuff, tell a story, engage people emotionally then hit them with the facts, have that emotional appeal. Remember, reach them in their guts, <clears throat> excuse me, and that helps open up their heads to take in information. Make it clear, simple, simple and understandable. You can convey a lot of information if you do it in a simple way, not dumbing it down, but making it clear. You wanna know your audience, talking about listening to Prince on the radio, I did earlier, right? Does that show I was speaking to the right group? Of course not. You guys probably have never even heard a song on the radio. Uh, but you want to use language that's appropriate for your audience, right? You want to use language that's appropriate for it. And don't forget the context. No assumed knowledge. This is something that happens with scientists a lot. I gave a talk to scientists uh, a few years ago who were saying that if I, if I wrote simply that it was dumbing things down, I'm sure you've heard that and I'm sure you've heard it about you. And, and it's not a fair assessment. So what I had them do is I, I said, please, anyone here who knows what string theory is, this is some big physics things that I have no clue about. If you know string theory, hold up your hand. And these are all um, climate scientists uh, dealing with coastal issues. None of them knew anything about string theory. No hand went up. And they said, so if I write it in a simple way that allows you to understand, is that dumbing it down or is that making it accessible? So assume knowledge means that you have a lot of knowledge in your head and you forget that other people don't. So you leave some of that knowledge out that helps them make sense. Make sure you don't do that either. And then make it engaging. What worked in the videos? The setting, what it conveyed, the vast, vastness of the world, the size of the problem. So all those things are really important when you're telling a story. 
And quickly, I want to acknowledge that there can be some impediments to communication. Politics always gets in the way, as you see over the last week and what's happened in Washington. The way you produce your work is also a big factor, as we've discussed. Complex messaging typically doesn't work. But there are a lot of important things for you to talk about. And there's something important that I think you, you need to understand is the idea of a media paradigm shift that they were going through right now. A paradigm shift is when the worldview that everyone shares changes drastically. It happened back around the 1500s, I think it was, when the Gutenberg printing press came in. Up until then, access to information was only for the elite, for the wealthy, because in order to get print, in order to learn to read and get print, was very expensive. It was done by hand, by monks in back rooms of churches. The Gutenberg press came around and it liberalized all of this and it made it much more democratic because suddenly the media was cheaper and more easily accessible. And it took 50 years for the world to figure out what that meant. And during that time, there's a lot of disruption. We're going through that now. Technology has drastically changed the world and it's made it probably poorer in some ways, but also richer in others. And one of the ways is that it's made it richer is when I started in, in, in the, at the, working for the networks in DC back in the mid eighties, if you wanted to do a, a four channel mix of a radio program, you needed uh, five Ampex recorders with big 10 inch reels of tape and you needed a studio with $100,000 worth of equipment. Now you can do a 30 channel mix on your computer using GarageBand on Apple or Audacity on uh, uh, PCs for free and you can do a 30 channel mix or more. That's liberalizing democrat democratizing access to media. Same thing with cameras, with video. You can shoot everything with your iPhone or your Android phone. You can do videos, you can do panoramas, you can do stills. You can do so many things that you could never have done 20 years ago. So this disruption has created an opportunity for people to get their own message out. Uh, and there are a lot of important things for you to talk about. You can talk as simply about how you feel about your education as something as big as climate change. And the important thing to know is there's never been an easier time for you to have your voice heard. So the point is, make yourself heard. Take on these important issues. It's your future. Use the tools you have. Elevate your voice and let people know how you feel. So with that, do we have any questions? Great, thanks, Dale. So I'd like to turn to our audience and, um, whoops, sorry, Dale, I just turned off your- That's fine. <laughs> oops. Spotlight. Hang on, I've got a little start thing here. Let me do that. Okay. Great, thank you. And I can stop sharing the screen now, right? Yes, yeah. Okay. So for our viewers, if you have any questions for Dale, please use uh, the Q&A box and let us know uh, what your questions are. Um, Dale, as someone, as a, so I'll, I'll get things started. As a, as a journalist for, for many years, um, you've also dabbled a lot in photography as well. And I think that, and I know that personally about you, but I, uh, um, there wasn't quite enough time to, to go into that. Are there, and your cat is now joining us. No, <laughs> he's going to whine for his food. Yeah. I have to hide uh, his food from his big brother. <laughs> Okay. Um, so are there, you know, do you have uh, any sort of favorite tools that you use that you like to use for, for communication? You know, are there, you know, we think of communication and the first thing that I always think about are written words and that's not always the case. And so I'm curious to hear from your perspective, what are some of the things that you've seen? Um, tools that people have used, uh, different types of visualizations, perhaps, um, that are meaningful. So you, sh you showed us some videos, you showed us a couple of photos. Um, are there other things that you would you would recommend? Well, there's, there's a lot there. I mean, I started out in radio when I was 17, and that was my medium for a long time. And eventually I learned that, that I'm not, I wasn't a radio person, I was a communications person. And there are different methods for different things. Some things are better told by images, some are better told by video, some are better told by print. So it's finding the right medium for the message that you want to convey, uh, I think is really important. Uh, and then there's a saying, you know, with uh, uh, cameras and a lot of things, but the best camera is the one you have with you. So everybody carries their phones with them. And I'm, I'm not fond of, of a lot of phone photography, but 
you can take some really good stuff with, with, with phones now. Uh, this is part of that leveling process too. It used to be that when the technology got in the way of creating radio, you could be a very good technocrat and always have a job, even if you weren't a good storyteller. But now that the technology is so simple and it doesn't take much to understand, it takes out that technological hurdle. And it means people with stories, even if they can't handle technology well, they can still tell stories well. And the equipment has allowed us to do that. So the fact that you can take a photo with your, with your cell phone, you can use a filter on it if you want to change the look. You can do all sorts of things to, to convey, you know, put some text on it and then send it out on Instagram or whatever platform you want to use. You can do a short TikTok video. There's so many ways of accessing things. And it's just, it's whatever the story is helps determine what that is. But I love the fact that there is so, there are so many opportunities. I shoot with what's called an SDLR, a, 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 a reflex camera, and it's a professional camera and it's expensive and it's bulky. And I get really, really good results with it. But you get decent results with your cell phone too. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a matter of what's easiest for you and then what's going to help you tell a compelling story. Great, thank you. So we have a couple of questions, so I will get to them in the order that they came in. Um, can you tell us about an article or news story that was particularly impactful in shifting people's opinion about a difficult issue? I guess this is quite broad, so maybe the most recent one. Uh, yeah, no, I'm not gonna go the most recent. I'm gonna go longer ago, <laughs> actually. <laughs> Because these are the ones that really, I've talked a lot about the history, the modern history of the environmental movement. And there is a, there's a very clear path here. There was a book called Silent Spring by Rachel Carson in 1962 that talked about uh, how quiet it was in her neighborhood because DDT had killed off all the birds, basically. It's much more eloquent and beautifully written than that. But that was the gist of the book. And, and it, it, it shocked the world. And it started the modern environmental movement, which led to a number of things. So there were stories. There was, I was growing up in Ohio when the Cuyahoga River caught fire. Imagine a river with flames shooting off it in 1969. That helped lead to the first Earth Day in 1970 when they thought they'd get tens of thousands of people. Uh, Gaylord Nelson, who founded it, and um, oh, I'm blanking it, Dennis Hayes, who he hired a 20, 20 something year old kid to run it. They thought they'd get tens of thousands of people. They got millions of people around the world to show up for the first Earth Day because these stories galvanized people. Uh, Love Canal. Uh, my parents lived on Love Canal for six months over in Buffalo. It was a hooker chemical that dumped a bunch of chemicals in this canal, sealed it up, they thought, and then sold it to the, to the local community, I think, for a dollar. Warned them that these chemicals were there, but they still built housing developments and they found all these chemicals seeping into the basement and uh, uh, it, it was causing cancer in kids and in parents and everything else. Horrible, horrible situation. Those stories galvanized the country to, to pass legislation to stop that from happening. Bhopal, the uh, accident in Bhopal in India where the chemical plant exploded and it killed thousands of people. That led to new legislation. So. I can point to many things that, that, that made an impact. I, I'm a strong believer in the power, power of the media, that the, the power of the media, that they can show these stories to galvanize the public, to push Congress to, to do, do the right thing. Congress has rarely done the right thing on its own. It needs to be pushed. And these are the ways that journalism, particularly what I do, can help make that happen. It's not that we're advocates, but we're just shining a light on these important stories that affect change. So I, I hope that answers the question. That's a, it's a tough one to get at, but there are many of those sorts of stories I can point to. Even, even last week with the, the, the uh, insurrection on the Capitol, you know, some of the images, oh my gosh, were so incredibly powerful. Even last night, seeing the National Guard sleeping on the floors of the Capitol, I used to work there, I used to cover that. I had a, a Capitol Hill pass to go in and do journalism there. And, and never thought I'd see the day when you'd see troops sleeping on the floors. There hasn't happened since the Civil War. Really, really powerful images that, that just, I think, I think shifted a lot of people's opinions about what was happening. Yeah, great examples, thank you. Um, so the next question is, and you got to this a little bit in your presentation was, you know, a lot of the climate change 
education uh, stories out there are all sort of doom and gloom uh, messages and, you know, end of the world scenarios. Um, but a lot of times those stories leave us um, feeling hopeless and helpless. Um, and so how can, how do you think we can communicate that we have the abilities to mitigate um, the worst of climate change and to, inst um, I guess, give and, and you know give us hope for action for people to take action instead of feeling that doom and gloom this is so important to me there's something called the solutions journalism network and uh if anybody's interested they should look into that because they they try and talk about these things and, and it is it's 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 incredibly important you know if, if you feel that there is no hope you're just going to throw up your arms and say well why bother what can i do and this was a problem with a lot of climate coverage early on it was about polar bears and other things that that people really couldn't relate to so so to me it's about finding relatable stories and that's a really important thing to be able to find stories and convey them in a way that people can relate to them, first of all. So, uh, Jason, that story with, with the, the coal plant, I thought that was a wonderful way. I mean, kids relate to that because they're kids and she's a kid. Parents relate to that because they have kids and they look at that and say, wow, this is, this is what our kids are going through. You know, you had a powerful mother there who was upset because her of her daughter's asthma and trying to find out what happened, but her daughter took control. I mean, that's a really powerful message that says these, these kids from a poor community who have no voice created a voice and they got heard and they affected change. So there are stories out there that you can do that even with climate. I mean, when you're looking at, at what's happening with the climate right now, there's so many things. The idea of an infrastructure bill that uh, uh, President-elect Biden is talking about, and not just him, presidents in the past have talked about and tried to get through, an infrastructure bill that focuses on clean energy can create amazingly uh, uh, good jobs that pay well, solar installation, windmill, turbine building, all these sorts of things create good jobs, and they help clean up the environment. They start uh, uh, reducing our dependence on, on uh, uh, fossil fuels. So there are a lot of stories like this that can show what can be done and what can be done fairly quickly if there is a will. The problem is the political will. We talked a moment ago about the lack of politicians or the inability of politicians to do something without being pushed. Um, but if, if they're pushed and shown there's a better path, we can affect change, but the stories have to convey that. They have to get the public uh, engaged, enraged, upset, and demanding something better. And, and that's the power of the media when it's done well and what it can do. I love the video with the guy sitting on the beach. To me, that was so, and I knew all the facts he was putting out there. I've, I've, I've known those, but they put it together so well, it made me cry. I mean, it's just, it's a wonderful, wonderful video that leaves you with hope at the end. And I think that's that's pretty amazing. Yeah, so I think it can be done. That's great, thank you. And it should be done. Yes, absolutely. Um, so as, a, um, as an expert in this area, um, what would you say to someone who's you know, interested in getting into communication and particularly communication of environmentally related issues? Um, what are some of the first steps that um, you can take well, there's all the school stuff, you know, there's the, the to learn, of course, but, but the, the thing I would suggest is start playing with the tools and don't worry about trying to get, I have a son who's 23 and he's amazing and he's incredibly brilliant. He's so much smarter than I am, but he's just paralyzed sometimes and he wants to do some videos, but he wants to do that perfect video right away. To heck with that. Uh, there's a book called Bird by Bird. It's about writing novels. And she has a chapter in there. I'll paraphrase uh, the, the, the title of one of the chapters. It's not this, but it's Crappy First Drafts. <laughs> With the idea that everybody wants it to be, the words be perfect right away. And what she says for writers is you, is you write a few paragraphs. And I do this all the time now. I might write a couple of pages. Now look at it and say, well, that sucks and this is terrible, but I've got three great lines here and that gives me my focus and then I can move forward. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. Don't be afraid to mess up. Play around a little bit. You don't have to show it to anybody. If you're, if you're into video, use your camera, make some videos. Try it out, see what you can do, see what fun it is and experiment. I mean, kids do this naturally anyway, but when they start thinking about showing it to someone else to get paralyzed, don't show it to someone else. Play around, 
learn the tools, learn the equipment. I mean, you have the advantage of being natives to this, um, that this is not something, you know, I'm old. I had to learn this stuff as it came along and I had a lot of bad habits that I had to change. You don't have that. You, you, you're, you've born into this and you have this great ability to absorb this stuff and, and use it and you watch it and you hear it and you look at it. And so it's already nothing new to you. So experiment with the tools that are out there. Play with your camera, play with the audio on it, play with uh, you know, every little bit that you can. And then when you decide, when you start learning to write messages and, and, and tell stories, you're already, the, the, the tools are not gonna be a problem. It's out of the way, you know how to do it. And you'll be able to intuitively know which is the best thing to use for that particular story. So obviously you gotta do the school, you've gotta to learn to write well, you've got to learn to, to, to how to communicate. You gotta to learn to tell stories and that's really important. It comes easy to some of us and not so easy to others. Me, it didn't come that easily. It was, it was practice, a lot of practice in learning how to do it. Others, it's just so natural but you have to learn to tell stories. And so those are the important things. But in the meantime, play with the equipment, figure it out, and then you can start telling messages. And then you can start, uh, start. and there's a lot of tools out there. There's Radio Rookies, which is uh, a thing for WNYC in New York. And they have uh, some great resources. I should have sent you some of the links, Cassie. They've got great resources there. They've got a guide to teach you how to tell a story in radio. Um, there's a lot of those sorts of things out there. Lynn Cherry produced the, uh, the video with Jasa, and I'm blanking on the name of her group, but um, uh, there's that group, Climate Action for Kids or something that, that she runs that, that has all sorts of messaging information on the, their website. So there are places you can go to learn to do some of the stuff while you're waiting to get into classes and things that you can learn more, but pay attention to your writing classes, pay attention to your writing classes, <laughs> practice, 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 and play with the tools. That's great, thanks. Um, and this is a, and in terms of uh, sharing links and information, Dale, I'll follow up with you and um, you know, we can put a, a list together Good. to share that with everybody along with the recording. Um, so I think this is a great question to end the session, um, which is sort of, you know, how long have you been doing this? Who have you taught and worked with? Um, and tell us a little bit more about, um, about you. Oh, wow. Um, I've been doing this a long time. <laughs> I'm much older than I look. Um, I, you know, it's, it's, it's been a journey for me. I've loved, I've been really blessed. I fell into this out of high school. I was 17 years old. Uh, that summer I got a job. I was ready to go to college. I had no idea what I wanted to do. One of my pieces of advice is always take a gap year, wait, grow up a little bit. I should have, and I kind of did because I got in radio as a disc jockey. I was a terrible disc jockey. And I had a friend who I was talking to, the guy who got me the first job and was asking about that one day. Because as part of my small station, I also had to do news. And, and I asked him, you know, what do you think of my jock? And he says, well, I really like the way you do news, which made me realize I really stunk as a jock and I was much better at news. And that's how, so I stumbled into it. I fell forward. And, but I was able to take advantage of, of a lot of wonderful opportunities and a lot of people who pointed me in great directions. Eventually did go to college, uh, did it backwards. I got my master's before my bachelor's, as you know. Um, it's just, it's, it's an odd sort of life I've had. But I've had a great opportunity to, to train, uh, to work around the, the world. I, I've done, I did the only newscast ever on NPR from another country during the first school four in London. And that was, that was a lot of fun and really interesting. I, people forget there was a big IRA bombing campaign going on in London while the Gulf War was going on. So I covered a lot of the IRA, bomb, IRA bombing stuff. Um, I was in South Sudan for a year, which was incredibly powerful. Uh, almost starved, didn't realize it. Lost 30 pounds in six months. Uh, and I was eating better than everybody around me. It was an amazing eye-opening experience that, that I would never give up. Um, and I've trained uh, around the world. I had a, uh, trained several times in Africa, which has been a joy. Zambia and Malawi was, was fantastic. So uh, it's been a pretty blessed life. I've been very fortunate, but part of it is you make your own opportunities too. That, that uh, you know, I did the things in London because I came up with the idea and they said, oh, we, we love it, but we can't do it. Every two weeks I went to, because we, everybody knew there was going to be a, an attack on, in, in Kuwait at some point. So every two weeks I'd go and say, hey, what do you think about that London newscast? Well, we love it, can't do it. So I got a bag packed, 
I can be on a plane in two hours. Okay, every two weeks, got a bag packed, can be on a plane in two hours. One day a phone call said, how soon can you be at the airport? I said, two hours. So there's a ticket waiting for you. That's how I got to London. So part of it is making your own sort of path and, and finding ways to create these opportunities. Uh, and if you do that, you're going to have a pretty amazing life. And that's a very great note and uh, point to, to end on. Well, Dale, thank you so much for your time. Um, and for our participants, uh, we will be sharing a link um, to the recording, which we'll also post on the Earth Institute uh, YouTube page. And any uh, resources that we'll share uh, will definitely also get posted to the Earth Institute website. Um, everyone will get a follow up. Um, and if you are interested in um, hearing more from Dale, um, and particularly if you're a high school student, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, he's going to be doing a workshop um, starting in April for high school students specifically around uh, how do you become a better communicator, particularly around um, uh, climate change. Um, so Dale, thank you again so much for your time. I uh, really appreciate it. And thank you to our viewers for tuning in. I wish I could have seen everybody, but it was uh, nice to nice to talk to you. And you get to see my cat anyway. So yeah, thanks, exactly. everybody. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.